Shalom to everybody. Tuesday is at noon, at noon uh, which is a, a weekly event uh, for all the members of the INSS and invited guests. Uh, we have a lunch together, we interact, we see each other, uh, and then we have a conference, a lecture, uh, sometimes from people coming uh, from the outside, some, sometimes from our own researchers. Uh, and it's great, by the way, the last two weeks, uh, Martin, last week was the former commander of the Navy, uh, Hilayam in Israel. Uh, he gave a very interesting talk. And the previous week, we had the ambassador from the Ukraine, from Ukraine here in Israel. And I must say that it was uh, not only very interesting, but quite dramatic. I mean, uh, um, you know, the way he describe what's happening there and so forth. So, interesting. So I'm going to let uh, Joel, who heads the, who uh, organizes the, the Tuesday at noon, uh, to introduce you, Martin, and you, Itamar. I just want to say that uh, aside from all the titles and uh, the extraordinary career of Martin, he is, uh, uh, in my view, uh, one of the, our, best friends and he's a member of our board of the INSS from the very beginning. Um, he's intimately connected uh, to our institute and if you want to put the blame of why I am here, uh, you may put some blame on him. Uh, so you may pay for that at some point. <laughs> uh, and and beside, uh, aside from that, Martin is an extraordinary good friend of Israel. I mean, um, he has done so much, and he keeps doing so much for our country in the, everything he does. So we are very, very grateful to you, and um, looking forward to uh, your talk, but uh, Joel is going to introduce you more formally. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tsari on Gimel. Um, I hope you survived the hummus. Uh, no, it's not easy, I know. It's not an easy task. Martin, please take your seat. Martin Indyk is a distinguished fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and a former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, and Special Assistant to President Clinton. Previously, Indyk was Executive Vice President of the Brookings Institution, where he had also served as Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy Program and the Founding Director of its Center for Middle East Policy. He served as President Obama's special envoy to the Israeli-Palestinian negotiation from July 2013 to June 2014. And he lives in New York. The gathering here is, of course, uh, is around uh, the new book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of the Middle East Diplomacy. I also want to invite Itamar Rabinovich, please. Professor Amaritus of Middle Eastern History at Tel Aviv University, is Israel former ambassador to the United States and former chief negotiator with Syria in the mid-90s, and a former president of Tel Aviv University. The floor is yours, Martin and Itamar. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize and, and welcome Martin's wife, Gail Burt, uh, who, uh, uh, <clears throat> in the context of today's meeting, worked directly with Henry Kissinger and is the president, I believe, of the American Ac chairman. chairman of the American Academy uh, in, uh, uh, in Berlin and a, and a very good, very good friend. I. Uh, I thought that if I were to introduce Martin, I'd have to ask him whether he wants to be introduced as Ambassador Indic or as Dr. Indic, which reminds me that Henry Kissinger was once asked, how do you want to be introduced as uh, Mr. Secretary, Dr. Kissinger, Professor Kissinger? And he said, your highness will do. <laughs> oh. uh, we are at a, at a very Kissingerian moment. I think uh, if we look at the international system now, not just the war in Ukraine, but uh, the whole relationship in the triangle, uh, America, China, Russia, 
um, the challenge to demo democratic systems by autocratic systems, energy crisis, and so forth and so forth, um, we would have wanted to see a Kissinger on, on the scene, somebody who, who has the vision uh, to try to, uh, to bring uh, order back. His, uh, his original dissertation and the first book were called A World Restored, about how Metternich restored order to Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, and uh, also had the savoir faire of a national security advisor and a secretary of state who could make things happen. And amazing, uh, amazing achievements are on his, his record from uh, his service with uh, President uh, Nixon, presidents Nixons and, and Ford. So uh, Martin undertook a, a, a major effort uh, to, to write a book about Kissinger's Middle Eastern uh, diplomacy. Uh, but uh, the book obviously is about, also about <coughs> Kissinger and, and his craft and, and ability and about the larger Middle East and about uh, Israel. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's a daunting, it was a daunting uh, effort. First of all, a lot has been written about it. Uh, and uh, the question arise, ar arose at the time, I think has been answered since, can you add something new? to a sizable body of literature. And secondly, fortunately, Kissinger is still alive. He was available to Martin as a resource, but as we know very well, Kissinger is a man very sensitive to his record and, and reputation. So to, to write this book uh, with Kissinger and with Kissinger watching was, I'm sure, not, uh, uh, not so easy as Martin might uh, perhaps uh, share with us. So, uh, having said all of that, let me now uh, pass the microphone to um, Thank you, Itamar, and uh, thank you all very much for coming today, and thank you to Joel and, and Manuel and INSS for uh, hosting me. Um, <clears throat> your little uh, joke about Henry, I thought you were going to tell the other one, which is he was uh, at an event and and the Itamar equivalent got up and said, uh, is Dr. Kissinger, he needs no introduction. And Kissinger then said, well, it's true, I need no introduction, but I like one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, Institute is uh, something very close to my heart and I'm delighted to see how it goes from strength to strength. And uh, I'm very proud of, uh, of, of the way in which the Institute has, has fulfilled a vision that, that <clears throat> Itamar and I shared when we joined with Frank Lowy in helping to establish the Institute, which was that it would be the, um, the, the best independent strategic think tank in Israel and, and represent Israel's views to the world. And uh, it's done that and, and then some. So, kolakavod to all of you. Um, I'm also very grateful for friends I see in the audience who have come today, uh, some of whom were directly involved in the events that we're going to discuss and others of whom have been um, partners uh, with me and Itamar as we um, struggled ourselves to try to uh, practice the art of diplomacy uh, in the Arab-Israeli arena. Um, and it was that uh, effort, which uh, ultimately, uh, the effort that I was involved in, ultimately failed, uh, failed fairly spectacularly at, at Camp David and, and thereafter, and, and failed again when I was involved uh, under President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry as a special envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, which ended in 2014. And we've had, as you're all aware, no negotiations between the Israelis and Palestinians, let alone agreements uh, since then, which is a very long time. Uh, and it was at that point when I felt very much that, that as a result of our negotiations, the sides were actually further apart at the end than they were at the beginning, which is quite an achievement if you think about it uh, for American diplomacy that I thought there's something fundamentally wrong here. Uh, 
that I need to understand. It's easy enough to blame both sides, and God knows they deserved it, if you'll allow me to say. But um, there was something wrong with the practice of American diplomacy. Uh, and so I decided that was why I decided to go back and look at where it all began with uh, Kissinger's efforts to end the 1973 Yom Kippur War and, and then launch the American-led peace process that uh, in his day uh, he succeeded in negotiating two agreements between Israel and Egypt, one between Israel and Syria, and really laid the foundations for an American-led peace process that led in fairly short order to the Israel-Egypt peace treaty and eventually to the Oslo Accords and the Israel-Jordan peace agreement and uh, one could say eventually to, uh, to the Abraham Accords uh, as well. Um, and even though, as Itamar said, there's been a great deal written uh, about Henry Kissinger and uh, by Henry Kissinger, 3,000 pages of his uh, volume, of, uh, of his uh, memoirs, voluminous memoirs. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there hasn't been an in-depth study of Kissinger's diplomacy in the Middle East. It's um, easy to forget that, that in his four years as Secretary of State, that is what he focused on. All the other things that we remember Kissinger for, the opening to China, the time with the Soviet Union, arms control, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Chile, uh, Bangladesh, etc. Just about all of that occurred in his years as National Security Advisor in the first Nixon's first term. But in the second term that ended rather spectacularly with Nixon's resignation and then the Ford uh, administration, Kissinger was basically devoted to trying to make uh, Arab-Israeli peace. At least that's what I thought he was doing. Uh, but when I uh, then set about uh, delving into the archives, and Kissinger as a man of history and a student of history, uh, documented every conversation and every negotiation he had. Uh, and uh, Itamar referred to Gail, uh, my wife, who, who was his secretary at the time, and she had to transcribe <laughs> every conversation uh, together with the other secretaries in his office so that even his conversation with uh, his many girlfriends, celebrity girlfriends, uh, is, are in the archives, uh, as well as his conversations with Nixon and Haig and Schlesinger and so on. And of most interest um, to you would be his negotiations and the memcons of his negotiations with Israeli and Arab leaders of the time, Sadat, Assad, Golda, Meir and, and Moshe Dayan and Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres and so on. And it's all there. It's thousands of documents, but they're all preserved and 95% of them have been declassified. So it's a real treasure trove. Uh, and, and it was fascinating for me um, because Kissinger, for reasons we can get into, was not just the master of the game of diplomacy, he was the master of obf obfuscation. Uh, he didn't really let on, uh, even in his memoirs, of what exactly he was up to. And there are reasons for that which we can get into to do with the environment that he was working in, which was a kind of anti-Semitic White House and an anti-Israel State Department. But essentially uh, what comes out of the documents was uh, this strange phenomenon that when Sadat or Rabin or Assad even would talk to him about taking the big step of trying to end the conflict, make peace agreements, Kissinger would consistently back them off and say, you know, that's not worth having or that's not achievable or that's not reliable. Uh, we have to try for something less. 
We have to go for smaller steps. And um, I, I've, I was kind of scratching my head at this. It's, it, it, it didn't make sense to me. And so I decided to go back and see what he had written about peacemaking. And in fact, it's very hard to find anything that he's written about peacemaking. What you find is a great deal about order and about the requirements of order in the international system. And as Itamar noted, his first book, which was his PhD dissertation, uh, was called A World Restored, Metternich, Castlereagh and the Problems of Peace. And so there it was up in the, in the title itself. He saw peace as problematic. Uh, and indeed, as he explains in the introduction to that book, uh, from his point of view, uh, peace was a problem for the order that Castlereagh and Metternich were trying to establish and that he himself was trying to establish in the order that he was restored, seeking to restore after the Yom Kippur War. Uh, why? Because in his study of history, he found that the pursuit of peace with too much eagerness and uh, passion could more often than not lead to its opposite. He called it the paradox of peace, uh, that it could lead to war. And, and he was, I think, focused more at that time of his own experience of the way in which appeasement had led to the Second World War or the Peace Treaty of Versailles had contributed to, to that, that process that led to the Second World War. Uh, and, and so therefore, his approach in, in everything he did was to try to build the basis for a stable order in this region. Before the 1973 Yom Kippur War, he thought that he had a system that would do that when he eventually wrestled control of Middle East policy from the State Department, which was to support the Shah of Iran, maintaining a stable balance of order, balance of power, I should say, in the Gulf, and to support Israel and Israel's uh, and the balance in favour of Israel, military balance in favour of Israel, in the Middle East heartland. And these were the two basic pillars. Of course, Saudi Arabia was part of it too, but it was the Shah and Israel. And that system of maintaining order was buttressed by the detente between the United States and the Soviet Union, which, would, uh, which specifically provided that neither superpower would seek to exploit developments in the region for their own advantage. That is to say, the Soviet Union was, would also support the maintenance of order based on this balance of power tilted in favour of, of the United States and Israel. And he discovered when the war broke out, to his great surprise, uh, he certainly did not expect it any more than, than Israel did, uh, that that system didn't work, that there was something missing. And the something that was missing from his point of view was a legitimizing mechanism that would make the order more acceptable in, in the Middle East case to the Arab powers who had just disrupted the stability, disrupted the order and gone to war. And therefore, they had to be given a stake in maintaining the order. And the legitimizing mechanism, therefore, was the peace process, because that would give the Arabs a stake in maintaining order as long as the process led to the return of the territory that Israel had occupied in 1967. It was to be territory for peace. But Peace, as I explained, was something that he didn't believe in. And uh, so therefore, uh, his, his approach was designed 
to buy time. Time to, ex the, to uh, enable the Arabs eventually to exhaust themselves and come to terms with Israel. And in the meantime, time for Israel to strengthen itself, to reduce its isolation with the support of the United States so that eventually the Arabs would accept Israel and Israel would be strong enough to make the ultimate territorial concessions that would end the conflict. Uh, that was his theory of the case. Uh, and therefore, in the meantime, his legitimizing process would be an incremental process. You remember he called it step-by-step -step diplomacy. It was to be a peace process based on small incremental steps, each one involving a territorial dimension of Israeli withdrawal, but on a long-term timetable and a, a process that would enable Israel to absorb the territorial concessions and risks involved in that, uh, in, in the process. And so that, that was essentially what Kissinger was up to that became clear from, from the deep dive into the archives. And, and I show that in the book. Uh, the the uh, approach was quite successful uh, in his time uh, and led, of course, two years later to the Israel-Egypt peace treaty. That did not occur on a timetable that Kissinger expected. Uh, and, and in my last interview with him, I asked him whether he ever regretted the fact that he had not uh, made peace between Israel and Egypt. He said it was obvious in, in the documents that Sadat was ready and Rabin was ready. Uh, they were talking to you about taking the big step of peace and you backed them off. And he said to me, you're right. He said, I don't, but I don't regret it. I'm glad it happened. But if I had been elect, uh, reappointed as Secretary of State, Ford had been re-elected. I would not have gone for a peace treaty the way that Carter did. I would have gone for another step. It would have been a non-belligerency agreement, the very thing that Rabin had wanted and that he'd refused to pursue. Uh, and, he said, and then he said, you know, I always feared that if I pushed it too hard, I would break it. And for me, that was a, uh, you know, a, what I call a light bulb moment um, because I was part of an effort and indeed every, every administration since Kissinger, when they got engaged in the peace process, pursued a similar effort to jump to the end game, to uh, conclude the peace deals to end the conflict and end the claims. And, and uh, we broke it. We broke it at Camp David and, and afterwards led to the Intifada and destroyed the whole basis of trust between, um, between the parties. And like Humpty Dumpty, it's been impossible to put it back together again. And, and you know, as I started to think about it in that context, in a kind of Kissinger frame, I suddenly uh, appreciated something that will probably be obvious to all of you, but I had not understood it, even though I was so involved in it at the time, which was that as much as Rabin locked horns with Kissinger, and if you remember back to that period in 1975 when Rabin said no, to Kissinger because there wasn't enough peace in what, what Sadat was offering uh, to give up for, for Rabin to agree to give up the strategic passes in the Sinai and the oil fields, that despite the fact that they'd had this knockdown, drag out fight in which Kissinger eventually uh, persuaded Perez and, and Rabin to accept his offer, 
uh, that despite all of that, when Rabin came around to introducing a peace process with the Palestinians, what did he do? He introduced an incremental step-by-step process, a three-phase withdrawal of the IDF from, from uh, the West Bank and Gaza with no, as he used to say, no sacred timetables and no definition of what the end game would be. Nothing on the Palestinian state in Oslo, nothing on Jerusalem, nothing on refugees, as, as you all know. Many of you were directly involved in it. Um, and, and it was that incremental approach that we, and talking about myself and we in the Clinton administration, didn't really appreciate. Of course, we got behind it, tried to make it happen, but as soon as we were encouraged by Prime Minister Barack at the time to go for an end of conflict deal, we went for it. And every time since, the administration has gone for it, whether it, whether it was, was uh, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or Donald Trump. Um, and, and so that is the fundamental uh, lesson from this uh, delving into history that, that I came up with. There's a lot more in the book and we can talk about in particular the, what, what it reveals about Kissinger's role in the, in the Yom Kippur War, which is very interesting, and, and his failure to pre- prevent war when he could have uh, in 1973, um, and his failure to pursue a Jordan option and the way that could have impacted on the Palestinian history of the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, a lot of other things had come out, but that is the essence of the, of the discovery that I had that I wanted to share with you. Okay. Thank you, Martin. I'll begin by, by presenting a, a few questions to Martin, and then we'll uh, we'll open up. Um, my first, uh, I, I will not ask you the, the two questions that you, in a way, raised yourself. I'm sure they'll come up in the in the in, in the discussion with the public, with the audience. Um, but the first one I wanted to ask about Kissinger and Nixon, because Kissinger may not have been able to do all of that if he didn't have the support of, an, of a president who was a terrible president domestically, but uh, a man with deep understanding of uh, foreign and security affairs. Can you talk a little bit about the Kissinger-Nixon equation? So <coughs> Nixon was, was a good example of the very thing that, that Kissinger feared about American leaders in particular when it came to uh, using the immense power bestowed upon them as the most you know, powerful leader in the world uh, and, and their desire for peace, particularly when it came to the Middle East. And Nixon wanted to jump to the end game and saw detente with the Soviet Union as uh, a vehicle for doing that in which the United States and the Soviet Union would impose peace on Israel and the Arabs. That was his idea of of, of the way to make peace. Um, it was Ford's, it was Carter's, but, but it, it started uh, with Nixon. And so Kissinger had to try to head him off uh, and uh, had to do it in an environment in which Nixon, whose instincts were basically anti-Semitic, uh, suspected Kissinger's motives as being too, as he, he said, always pushing Israel's agenda. Uh, that was his, his view of Kissinger, so much so that at the beginning of the administration, when he was giving Kissinger responsibility for the rest of the world, there was a, a Middle East carve-out in which Nixon said, you can't deal with the Middle East, the State Department's going to deal with the Middle East. He hated the State Department. He was deeply suspicious of them. But in this case, he was ready to give them the Middle East and keep Kissinger away from it because he believed Kissinger had dual loyalty, that he was actually loyal to Israel. 
and couldn't be trusted. And time and again you see it in the documentation that he'll say it to Haig, he'll say it um, to, to uh, Joe Sisko, uh, he'll even say it to Dobrynin, the uh, Soviet ambassador, that you can't trust Kissinger because he's pushing Israel's cause. So that was the environment in which Kissinger was operating. And that's why I say he obfuscated what he was up to because he had to make Nixon feel that he was actually pursuing this agenda of, of a, you know, a comprehensive imposed peace uh, when, in fact, he had uh, something very much else in mind. Uh, he, he was able to succeed with Nixon because there was another side to Nixon which admired Israel, admired Golda Meir, uh, he, he, he admired Israel's, quote, moxie, um, and uh, he, he saw Israel as playing a very important role in the competition with the Soviet Union. And so there was this kind of ambivalence about his approach. Uh, he particularly appreciated the role that Israel played <clears throat> in the Jordan crisis of 1970. Uh, and it was, that was a kind of turning point for him with Kissinger and, and Rogers in the State Department because Rogers was opposed to, to giving Israel a role in deterring the Syrians and the Soviets in the Jordan crisis of 1970. And um, he decided to come down on Kissinger's side to use Israel, and it worked out very well in terms of defusing that crisis. And from that point on, he was not only ready to give Kissinger responsibility, but he was ready to go along with him. There were many times in which he would nevertheless intervene and tell Kissinger, you need to, um, you need to press the Israelis. You need to push the old lady, as you say. Um, that was particularly the case after the Yom Kippur War um, when he, he said, you know, we really need to get on with this. And he wanted to, he, he issued instructions to Kissinger when Kissinger was on his way to Moscow to negotiate the ceasefire um, on the weekend that was known as the Night of the Long Knives, or the Saturday Night Massacre, in which he, he fired the special prosecutor, Watergate special prosecutor, you remember that. That was the night that Kissinger was in Moscow. He nevertheless had taken the time to issue written instructions to Kissinger to sit down with Brezhnev and uh, work out the details for imposing a comprehensive peace on, on the uh, warring sides. And uh, Kissinger completely ignored his uh, instructions and buried them. Uh, and because Nixon was then completely caught up in Watergate, he could get away with it. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, Kissinger and the 73 war. One aspect of uh, this larger issue, the question of resupply. As a, was a controversy as to who, uh, who uh, delayed the resupply, Kissinger or Schlesinger, it was the famous Walter Lacker article and commentary that uh, accused Kissinger of, of being the culprit. Kissinger himself, I know, was very sensitive to this issue and uh, in a way was quote-unquote exonerated finally by Shimon Peres when Kissinger came to the president's uh, conference uh, during Peres' uh, presidency and Peres from the stage quote-unquote exonerated him for his, for his role in that, in that issue. So uh, whatever you can tell us about uh, this issue would be great. Well, um, it's a long story and I, I detail it in, in the book, um, but I'll try to, to summarize it in this way. Kissinger at first expected that Israel would win a quick and easy victory. Uh, Kissinger was not informed of the setbacks that, that uh, Israel suffered on, on the Golan and, and on the Suez Canal. Uh, for three days, and 
to my great surprise, American intelligence in those days uh, was t completely dependent on on Israel for real time intelligence. Um, they, to the extent that they did photographic missions over over the battlefield and so on, it would take them days to process that and and get the information. Uh, so they were highly dependent on Israel, and Israel wasn't telling telling them what was happening in those first few days. You all remember it. Uh, better than me, what that was like, because it didn't tell the Israeli public either, uh, and and so that was the assumption he was operating on that Israel was basically turning the tide of battle. Uh, when he was finally informed on on the, uh, I guess it was the third night, that that uh, there was a problem and that Dinitz, uh, the uh, Israel's ambassador. Uh, that he that uh, he needed to see him in the morning and to brief him. Uh, Kissinger realized something was up. Hi, thank you for coming, Vivian. I have to say something about Simcha Dinitz because um, I think he is the unsung hero of so much of this period uh, in terms of the the interaction between Kissinger and and, and uh, the Israelis and. Um, his, I don't think his role is really appreciated and his memoirs of this period have not been published. Vivian was very kind to to uh, give them to me and, and I use them extensively, quote from them extensively. Um, but but he, he was an extraordinary uh, diplomat who, who uh, manipulated, who understood what Kissinger was doing in terms of the art of manipulation and manipulated him back, and in particular, in this particular instance, uh, did that because uh, Kissinger needed Israel to be successful in its counteroffensives. <coughs> were he to succeed with his diplomacy, the first requirement of his diplomacy was a ceasefire, and a ceasefire in in which. Uh, Israel would come out the winner, but Sadat at least would emerge with his dignity intact. So it was a very careful, uh, complicated game that he was playing. But he needed Israeli military pressure to convince Sadat and Assad to accept a ceasefire. They rejected the first one that he tried to negotiate. So it was in his interests to have Israel uh, succeeding on the battlefield. So the idea that he was trying to hold up the arms was completely contrary to his objective and his interests. Simcha understood this. And so when, when he got the word that the Israeli counteroffensive, which Kissinger had been encouraging on the Golan Heights, wanting them to go to Damascus, quote unquote, and pushing them to do that. And that counteroffensive was held up. Uh, Dinitz told Kissinger that's because we're not getting the military supplies. In fact, as those of you who know, know the details of that particular operation would, would know, it was held up because the Iraqis suddenly came onto the battlefield. And they had to pause the offensive to deal with the Iraqi division of tanks that came out of right field. Um, but Dinitz knew that, but he didn't tell Kissinger that. He told Kissinger the reason that they'd stopped was because they didn't have the arms. And that was the first time that Kissinger, you know, believed that, in fact, what he had been doing was inadequate. What, what had he been doing? He'd been trying to get commercial aircraft to provide the resupply. And it was, it was not working because the Pentagon wouldn't order the commercial fleet to fly there. So the whole thing wasn't working and suddenly he sees that his strategy is going up in smoke because of a lack of resupply. That's when he went with Schlesinger to Nixon and said, We've got to do something about this. We need to send C5As. And the proposal, original proposal was to send all of 
the aircraft by jumping across aircraft carriers to get them there and C5As to take the military material. And, but they proposed three. And it was Nixon who said, God damn it, Henry, if we send, we're going to get blamed if we send three or if we send 30. So just send everything that flies and do it now. And that was Nixon's contribution. So he didn't, he wasn't holding it up. He was, he, he was trying to articulate an approach that would keep it under the radar because he feared that, that if it was overt, the Arabs would impose an oil embargo. And as soon as it went overt, they imposed an Arab oil embargo. Uh, so it wasn't an unreasonable concern of his to try to do this in a way that would achieve the objective of enabling Israel to succeed with its counteroffensives, but wouldn't provoke uh, an Arab oil embargo. Nixon was the one who took the decision to say, to hell with it, we just give Israel everything that it needs. Thank you. Let's now uh, open up, or that I believe you, you wanted to say something. Yeah? I did. Uh, many thanks for the illuminating presentation. To a certain extent, to write a book review for the strategic assessment of the institute. Um, and the key observation made today is about the step by step approach. I think this is very valid, will be very valid uh, if we have ever another process. Which takes me back to the three years since the rise to power of Sadat and at the end of 1970 to the war. And Sadat comes with a proposal, step by step. And why didn't Kissinger push Golda to accept this approach? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. And, and uh, the, the essence of it is as follows. Number one, he didn't take Sadat seriously. He used the word buffoon to describe him. Uh, he said, um, actually in an interview to an Israeli journalist years later, that he thought he was some kind of character out of the opera Aida. Um, so that, that was number one. Number two, uh, Golda had made it clear to him that she wasn't interested and had bought uh, him off, bought time, uh, by saying, we'll do it after October when we're going to have elections, after the elections, like Achareha Hagim. Um, and Nixon had told Kissinger, we've got to keep things quiet in the lead up to the November 72 election. So he was already in that mode of just keeping things quiet, waiting for the American elections, waiting for the Israeli elections. And, and in the meantime, he thought the system that he'd set up, as I described to you, would hold things. And he was constantly checking with the Israelis and Israeli intelligence was constantly telling him nothing to worry about. The Arabs will never attack, so on. So he thought it could wait. Uh, now, the critical moment came in February of 1973 when Sadat sent his national security advisor, Hafez Ismail, uh, to see Kissinger. And Sadat had actually asked for this meeting after July 1972 when he had thrown out the Soviet uh, military advisors. Something that Kissinger had wanted to happen, had said publicly, should happen way back in 1969. He said the time will come when the Arabs want to remove the Soviets from their midst and, and that's the time when we should engage. There's another reason why he should have engaged. But because he didn't take him seriously, uh, he put off that meeting until February. His excuse was the Vietnam peace talks. And finally, when he sees him in February, one of the first things that Hafez Ismail says to him in their formal uh, meeting 
is, you know, um, we're very pleased to open this channel, and I'm honored to tell you that the president of Egypt would, would be happy to welcome you in Cairo for an official visit. And Kissinger writes a little note to Peter Rodman, his aide, saying, what's the second prize, question mark. Um, so that, that was his attitude that, you know, this is just not serious and he'll play along. But then, as you can see in the protocols of this discussion, Hafez Ismail makes a far-reaching offer, a step-by-step -step offer indeed, uh, and, and talks about an idea that Nixon kind of introduced in their meeting with Hafez Ismail of the idea of uh, separating security from sovereignty, that Egyptian sovereignty over the Sinai would be recognized, but Israel's security would require it to retain uh, territory in the, in the meantime. It would be a gradual process. And that's what they discussed. And Hafez Ismail said, we're not going to wait for the Palestinians or the, or the Jordanians. We can start the engines together, but we're prepared to move ahead. That was the first indication uh, when uh, Kissinger talked about coordinating with the Soviets. Hafez Ismail said, we're operating on our own. We don't need the Soviets. That was news to Kissinger. So he came out of this meeting very excited and uh, reported to Nixon that there was a real opportunity here. and. Um, they were kind of thinking about what next steps they would take when Yitzhak Rabin, Israel's ambassador in Washington, comes in to get the briefing from Kissinger and Kissinger tells him about this in a rather excited tone and Yitzhak, in, in a way only he can do, <laughs> forget about it. There's nothing here. There's nothing new here, he says. Um, and Kissinger gets quite defensive, says, well, it may not be new to you, but it's new to me. Rabin says, no, there's nothing that can be done with this. This, this is, by the way, not a fair characterization of Rabin because he was interested in trying to get something moving. But, but in, in, a, in a typical way that happens between uh, Israeli and Arab, uh, with the United States stuck between Israel and the Arabs, anything that the other side offers that the United States might be interested in immediately has to be um, undermined and, and dismissed by the other side for fear that we'll take it seriously and try to convince them to accept it. So that's what he did. Anyway, Golda comes to town the next day. No way we're going to deal it, do anything about this. And they backed off. Um, they backed off. There were other things they had to deal with. The Vietnam was, was coming. The peace deal was coming apart. Um, Watergate was already starting up and, you know, events uh, led them to ignore it because they thought it could hold, uh, you know, that the status quo would hold, that the order was stable. And so they missed the opportunity. And Kissinger himself, when he writes about it in his memoirs, completely distorts what Hafez Ismail actually said and presents it as a very hard-line position on the part of the Egyptian National Security Advisor. Um, because I think, you know, he, he, I don't think I know, he felt in retrospect that he had missed the opportunity. Person who really knew what 
real uh, balance of power was between us and our enemies. And he used to visit uh, Washington at least three times per year. Made a point of seeing not only Kissinger, but also the head of the CIA, certainly the Secretary of Defense, his counterpart. And uh, the Prime Minister didn't like this at all. Therefore, um, what the uh, usual uh, uh, a, uh, usual uh, sequence of affairs was that um, I was instructed relatively nice when the Secretary of was thinking of coming to Washington. He would pass it on to the head of the CIA, he would pass it on to everybody else. Then suddenly, uh, out of the blue, uh, there would come a uh, request from Washington that Shalayan would come. Obviously, it wasn't because of this. I'm saying this not because this is just a uh, part of the uh, that's the inside uh, story, but also because what Dayan had to say was considered by the United States as 100% pure intelligence. I've been following the work of Dayan a long time to realize what had happened and when it happened. Uh, we all know what happened in Japan during the war, and the rest is history. I'd like to ask you a question. The question is on the issue of secrecy. If at any time uh, you would think of the idea of what it meant of conducting a uh, when each side has a secret on his part that he entrusts to the mediator. Uh, the mediator is the person who will decide how we will use the secret. And as you know, in certainly one case, and this was not Kissinger, but it was in Syria, when uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what Israel was willing to give the Times United, and you were there in a very key position in the matter. Uh, the Secretary uh, uh, Christopher decided to tell uh, Assad exactly what it is that he had in his pocket. The question arises, what was the role of using secrecy on the part of uh, Kissinger? I thought any time that he was using secrecy on his side. Yeah. I never met him in public. Yeah. The only time I met him was years later in Berlin at the conference my name and said he would like to read the uh, file on, his, on him in, the, <laughs> in Mossad. And the answer was I couldn't provide it because he would need truckloads. <laughs> he must have been very pleased with that. He was. He was extremely pleased and I said it loudly and everybody in the room was, was really uh, uh, very happy about it. But the, the issue of secrecy, and I'm asking that because we are now in the position which we have an agreement that uh, worked out by a former prime minister who's still around. And he introduced a secret uh, clause in the Abrahamic Accord. <coughs> the question is, what does it mean when you have secrecy in a, in a final uh, accord <coughs> of peace? The only uh, uh, item or the only uh, uh, instance that I can think of Secrecy was the Molotov Ribbentrop Agreement, which there was a, an annex that ultimately Russia and Germany would carve up Poland. Is it a, a correct way of hand, handling the, the negotiation in your experience? And how do you li look at the uh, function of secrecy in these negotiations? Uh, thank you, Ephraim, and I have to say in in public, uh, thank you especially for the way you helped me uh, uh, with the book, in particular understanding Rabin. Uh, there are several instances in which, which uh, Kissinger used secrecy, um, and it, it was in the context of secret understandings between the United States and Israel. Uh, I'm not aware that he had similar arrangements with with any of the Arab uh, interlocutors, but he definitely did with Israel because his whole approach was designed to conspire with Israel 
in order to uh, bring the Arabs along, conspire in the, in the sense that the purpose of the, of the exercise was to get Israel to give up territory in order to facilitate the step-by-step -step process. A hell of a challenge at any time. It was a hell of a challenge in those days as well. He wanted to conspire with Israel so that Israel would give him in his pocket a, a willingness to give up territory. But he would never tell the Arabs that he had it in his pocket, unlike Warren Christopher. Rather, he would use it to show the Arabs that he was delivering Israel, that they needed to work with him because he was the only one who could actually get these concessions. And then there's, a, there's an amazing protocol of, of an argument that he has with Golda Meir over three nights in, in Washington. And you, were, you were there in Washington at the time, uh, in which Kissinger tries to convince her that she has to be willing to give up some territory and the only way that she can protect Israel from the dangers involved in this is to conspire with him, to reach agreement on what Israel will give up, which, which he will then go to the Arabs and say, I can't possibly get that for you, I can get something less. But basically convince them that he was, he was the one who could deliver. And he had to try to convince her that it was in her interests to give him the ability to show the Arabs that he could deliver Israel. The whole concept of delivering Israel was something she rejected. But for him, it was critical to the art of his diplomacy was to be able to show that he and he alone, the United States alone, could deliver territory to the Arabs and therefore use that to get them to respond to him on the things that, that um, she needed. Now, this reached an absurdity um, when Diane came to town uh, after this battle with Golda where he finally convinced her. By the way, Aurelie Ariv was critical in that process as well of convincing her uh, to go along with this game. Diane comes to town and he's got a fully developed concept of an Israeli first withdrawal from the West Bank of the Suez Canal. And uh, not only is it fully developed, but he's managed to get the cabinet, well, she managed to get the cabinet to approve it. So it's a cabinet-approved uh, Israeli withdrawal plan uh, that Dayan delivers to Kissinger. And Kissinger is thrilled with this, fits his whole concept. But he's got to keep it secret from Sadat. And while he's engaged in these negotiations with Dayan, developing how they're going to play the game, uh, somebody walks in with a cable reporting from Geneva where Mota Gur is representing the Israeli military delegation in negotiations with the Egyptian military delegation. That's the uh, follow-on from the opening of the Geneva conference. Kissinger had no time for that. It was just a showpiece that, that, that was a kind of front channel negotiation. Uh, and Mota Gur has outlined the full plan that the cabinet has approved to the Egyptian to Gamasi in, no, not Gamasi, I don't remember who it was, but to the Egyptian general in Geneva. And Kissinger hits the roof and he says, what, what use am I going to be if you've already given it to the Egyptians? So Diana is extremely embarrassed by this. And they cook up a whole series of, of acts, starting with the two of them going out to brief the press to say that they've had an interesting discussion, Diana's going to go back and consult with the cabinet, um, and uh, you know no decisions have been made, and uh, Kissinger will then come out and and uh, so on. Two conspiring with Dinitz to have uh, Kissinger stay for three days in Israel, supposedly 
trying to get the cabinet to agree to something they've already agreed to. So that Sadat will be convinced that Kissinger is actually delivering the Israelis. Um, of course, Sadat wasn't fooled by any of this, but it was a nine-month uh, charade that Kissinger kept up in order to uh, maintain the, the idea that he was producing concessions from um, the uh, Israelis. And, and um, you know, to update to uh, the, the time that uh, Itamar and I were involved with, with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and, and Warren Christopher, and you said it, I mean, Christopher did the exact opposite of Kissinger. He told uh, Assad what, what Rabin was prepared to do. Uh, he, he, he gave away any pretense of having any kind of a leverage here or delivery or so. And, of course, Sadat, uh, Assad pocketed and asked for more. Um, and that's just one example of, of the, the, the reason I wrote this book is because we knew not Kissinger. We American uh, diplomats that came after him simply knew not Kissinger, knew not this, this particular manipulative art of uh, American diplomacy. For this uh, forum to be successful over time, it needs to begin on time and end on time. So I'll take one more question, this time from this wing. Mark, please. Martin, just a short question. I hope it was a long answer. In terms of understanding the Israeli government, the well, I think this is what I, I mean, there are lots of things that I, I've learned along the way. Um, but this is, this is an insight that I didn't know, that I didn't understand, even though I'd written a dissertation, in part about Kissinger's uh, diplomacy, but it was much more about the ability of small, smaller states like Israel and Egypt to resist the influence of their superpower patrons which, by the way, was a concept that Kissinger never understood. The power of the weak was something that was beyond his ken because uh, for him, uh, international society was a hierarchical society and order was maintained by the superpowers and the great powers and the smaller powers, were, were sim their role was simply to play along. Uh, so uh, that was what my dissertation was about, but it was um, much more the appreciation of the value of incrementalism that I've described to you that I um, had not appreciated. And, and um, I think it, it actually has relevance uh, today. Um, now we have a situation in which the United States is essentially pulled back and is no longer really engaged in, in the effort to promote a peace process. Or rather, we're going along and trying to support uh, the idea of, um, I guess it's called here, shrinking the conflict um, and taking economic steps designed to relieve the pressure on the Palestinians and and it stabilized the situation that way. The whole concept of taking steps is, of course, Kissingerian in, the, in the terms of his step-by-step -step diplomacy. But what he said uh, and what he found as he developed his diplomacy was that there had to be a territorial component. The legitimizing mechanism was a territorial mechanism. And, and that's what I would say about the current situation, uh, that the economic steps are important and, and actually valued by the Palestinians. I don't know whether you saw there was a, a poll uh, last week, a Palestinian poll, showed 60% of Palestinians um, approved of or supported the, the steps that Israel is currently taking. Uh, which is pretty unusual. Uh, but I think that if, uh, if we follow the Kissingerian uh, 
uh, methodology, there needs to be a territorial component. The originator of the concept of shrinking the conflict, Micha Goodman, if you read his book, as I'm sure many of you have, has a territorial component in, in, in his uh, approach. And so I think it's essential that the United States get behind the idea of adding a territorial component. Now, the first reaction to that is going to be this government can't possibly give up territory in the West Bank, it'll collapse. But actually, it's already doing so in small ways. Talking about leasing territory in Area C to the Palestinians, giving permits uh, for Palestinian building in, in Area C. Um, but I want to end by telling a story which I put in the book, but it's only a minor, almost a footnote. Um, but it's something that, that has always struck me as important and not well known. The last night of the negotiations that I was involved in between the Israelis and the Palestinians in March of 2014, uh, we were engaged in an effort to try to get agreement between the Netanyahu government and, and uh, Abu Mazen, Palestinian Authority, PLO, uh, for the extension of our final status negotiations for another nine months. And we had been, as usual, wrapped around the axle of what was going to happen with settlements and what was going to happen with settlements in Jerusalem. And, and we were really making no progress. When on that night, Yitzhak Molcho, representing the Prime Minister, and Tzipi Livni, who was heading the Israeli delegation to the negotiations, came into the room and offered to Saab Arakat and, and Majid Faraj, the Palestinians there, uh, on behalf of the Prime Minister, quote unquote, uh, 30,000 dunams in Area C that would be handed over to the Palestinians, not permits for building and so on, 30,000 dunams that would be handed to the Palestinians for to do with whatever they liked. Um, and Moho explained, and Moho's a lawyer, that the uh, Minister of Defence has the authority to do this and it does not require a cabinet decision. I'll say that again. It does not require a cabinet decision. And um, the reaction of, of uh, Saab Arakat was very positive for once. He said, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back and, and brief uh, uh, Abu Mazen, um, but I have one request, is that you consult us on where the 30,000 dunams will be, because this will be very important for the towns and cities of the West Bank that are starved of, of land, and that you not do any deals with Palestinian land sharks. Deal with us. Um, and that was it. We all went to bed. It was 3 a.m. I was convinced we had a breakthrough in the offing. And the next thing is I actually it was at 11 o'clock the next morning. I was uh, meeting Gail at the airport at the baggage uh, claim. Uh, and... Um, I get this call from the embassy to say that Abu Mazen has uh, entered into a, an agreement with Hamas to, uh, to have a joint government. And I call, call up Saab. I wake him up and I say, what the hell? I used a little more colourful language. And he was completely oblivious to it. He didn't know anything that I was talking about. He said he hadn't had time to brief Abu Mazen on, on the night's events. And uh, that was the end of the story. Uh, the Hamas agreement uh, with, that Abu Mazen struck gave uh, Netanyahu reason to call off the negotiations because he wasn't going to negotiate with Hamas. And, uh, and that was the last we ever heard of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations to this day. Uh, so nothing came of that particular offer. Years later, I asked uh, somebody involved in the negotiations, who shall remain nameless, what that was about on the Israeli side. How come 
Netanyahu uh, made that offer. Uh, and the answer was that um, uh, it was designed to avoid getting blamed. So then I understood that Bibi probably knew that Abu Mazen was about to do this, and uh, that's why he made the offer. Um, and why he was so furious with me when I went out and blamed both sides uh, for the breakdown of the negotiations. But the fact of the matter is, the offer was made. It is possible. There can be a territorial component to the step-by-step -step incremental approach that the current Israeli government is following. And I believe that that is a very important way to build, rebuild confidence and lay the groundwork eventually for a final status negotiation. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, you may. That was fascinating, a fascinating window into a fascinating book. And I will end with a recommendation to actually read the book and maybe even buy it. Bye-bye. <laughs>